Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? Yeah, not too bad, thanks. You can is the audio okay? Can you hear me all right? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, all good. All good over here, yeah. All right. You're on a you're not turning off sideways for some reason. Oh, yeah, you you're actually sideways on mine. I know you now you're okay. Aha. Uh -huh. You're good. There you go. <laughs> and we're in. Yeah, nice one. Um, yeah, so Ethan, pleasure having you on today. Um, it's just a small lockdown project I started. Um, been interviewing um, mainly new bands and a, a few other more established people within the music industry as well. Um, and just really getting some, getting to know a bit more about their stories and, and kind of where, they, where they're planning on going as well musically going forward. Yeah, yeah so um, with, um, with my guests so far, I've been taking it right back to the beginning. So um, growing up, your like, early influences musically, really. Early influences. Um, well, I would. It's it's. It, you know, we could talk for hours about early influences. I suppose. I mean, I think. I think I was probably initially as a young child. I kind of discovered music without knowing any external references for it when I was my one of my earliest memories in life actually was picking up you know what I've got one here I can show you and dulcimer okay um which a friend of my dad's um happen to have one lying around and I've always got this thing close to close to hand this is the first instrument I ever learned how to play oh wow um and it's wow. it's a very simple instrument you play it on your lap and and you just I mean it's going to be hard to do it on, on the thing but yeah yeah very simple instrument it's kind of a drone instrument yeah yeah there's a melody string here so um so i found my the, my dad left left this left left his one lying around in the in in, in, in and, and i picked it up when i was about two and a half three years old okay yeah and I had this sort of incredibly vivid memory of sitting with this thing. I was so little, it sat, it rested on the arms of the chair of the armchair. So, and, and it would, and I would sit and just listen. Okay, yeah. The, to the overtone. I mean, it's the most extraordinary sound. So beautiful. And, um, and, 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 the, it was just it was magical right from the word go and I I, I, I recall just thinking to myself what an incredible thing that sound will provoke you get an instant emotional connection with something you know mm. when you, you so you'll play a chord or a certain couple of series of notes or whatever it was and it will invoke an incredibly an, an emotional reaction and I was just mesmerized by it you know from yeah. so right back from the very very beginning music i discovered music incredibly young and mm. and, became, and was just instantly obsessed yeah so um and that was obviously um you know obviously a, 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 a huge part of that was my was my was my dad and so yeah. a lot of my dad's my musician as well so you know it, it, it progressed very quickly I was around a lot of musicians when I grew up mm -hmm. um, and I always expressed an interest in um, in in what they were playing and everything I, I was I, I was clearly very into drums at a very early age so my dad bought me a little miniature drum kit okay yeah again when I was around three or four years old I think just because you know i went to visit him on a session somewhere and i just made a beeline for the drums and you know it, yeah. you know annoyed everybody kind of madly or whatever as most kids probably would but i was lucky enough that my dad kind of went oh he's into the drums you know and was in a position to to buy me a little drum set mm. 
So, you know, and as things progressed, obviously those guys were amazing musicians. And, um, uh, and, and I was, what's the word? Well, yeah, I was encouraged, I guess, by some of the guys that were really good friends with my dad. So were probably people that you may not necessarily know have heard of, like guys like Andy Fair with the low and, and Bernie Ledden were two of my dad's closest friends. They were both guitar players. They, they had a lot of time for me and they would show me stuff on guitar. And my dad yeah. used to show me stuff on guitar. And, and um, you know, two of the drummers that were good friends of dad's were, probably are people that you would know, Charlie Watson yeah. and Kenny Jones. Yeah. Um, and they were also incredibly encouraging and would always, you know, show me tricks and how to tune or, you know, little techniques here and there. And so I had an incredible um childhood growing up around these guys because i didn't know it was special they were just friends and dads that were musicians you know what i mean yeah, it was just, yeah exactly uh, yeah um so you know and then you know when when and so the musical influence thing was quite broad right from the very beginning and obviously it was it yeah. was the radio mm -hmm. i mean my you know uh mainly um so it was classic 70s radio you know yeah. i mean super tramp <laughs> yeah. i remember thinking they were amazing um i remember floyd there was a you know brick i remember when another brick in the wall came out that was another big one for me um but then i got into my own thing a little later on when i was a teenager like a young teenager it was the jam and the sex pistols and sure. and all of that kind of stuff and and but it was you know it was it was so broad it was music was you know i, I never i would i never got into that kind of blinkered thing of like oh this genre is my genre yeah and it was it was always yeah go on for, for yourself um like so you say mid mid teenage years late late teenage years was your aim did you have in your head that you kind of always wanted to work within music or did you want to be in a band or was that your first venture like yeah i was a musician i mean i was a yeah. musician i i started off i you know my the first song i played on was a song called Something Inside So Strong by a guy called Labby Sifre. That was in 1986. I was 16 years old mm -hmm. and I played drums on that record. And um, and that was it. And I, it's, and I was kind of, I was off, you know, I was, yeah. I was, I'd left school um, and I just kind of went headlong into it. I mean, I needed a job, right? I needed a, a steady paycheck. Yeah. And I got a job at a recording studio in London and um, as a, as a, you know, dog's body. And, um, and then I ended up very fortunately getting a job at a &M Studios out in Los Angeles in um, 86, 87, somewhere around that period of time. And, and, and I was away. So the yeah. two things always kind of went hand in hand. I was always a musician and I also continued to engineer and, and, and you know, be, be, in the, be in the studio as well, making records in, in that department. So I never really... Yeah. delineated one from the other they were all kind of a, sort of a means to the same end really and i you know i don't know that there was ever a point where i kind of re remember waking up and going oh i want to be a musician now or whatever it was it just it had yeah. always been <laughs> i was never going to do anything else yeah of course you know? i mean i think my dad was always encouraging he was always trying to get me to find something else to do that every time i was interested in anything else he'd always be like really encouraging he'd be like you know Okay. I was into architecture at one point or archaeology or photography or whatever. And he'd be like, oh, yeah, you know, you should, you know, go and do that, you know. <laughs> and so I remember when, <laughs> when I left school, you know, that was that point was it, none of these things are ever going to take the place of music. So you know, I remember that moment where it was like, well, I think it's just time I get on with it. Like further education isn't going to serve me any purposes. There's no point in me staying in school anymore because I know. I want to be a musician and at that time there were no colleges around doing um the courses that you can do now in terms of uh, uh um, you know learning how to be an engineer or or, or you know yeah. teach you how to be a record producer or what any of those kind of things the only way through was through the studio system in those days so that was it that, that was yeah. my path and off i went nice <laughs> um so obviously while whilst you're over in america you've worked with with some uh, really big bands and produce help produce some like really good albums as well. Is it okay if I touch on a few of them and, and see where um see any of your sure. mem memories through these times? Yeah. So, um so back in uh well obviously you've worked um uh, you've done the Heartbreaker album and then Gold album with uh, Ryan Adams. 
And um, yep. the Gold album was actually one of the first. Before that, I would say I was mainly into like pop music and hip hop and just like a, any old kid would. But when that album came out, my uncle introduced it to me, and it really just hearing like songs like New York, New York, New York, and um, tunes like that on there. Yeah. So, do you have any memories of uh, making that album? And how was Ryan to work yeah. with? Yeah, he's bonkers. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, you know, really you know so full of music you know yeah. so full of music um and really kind of courageous and brave when it comes to just getting on with it and doing it you know i mean i like to work kind of live without a net if you like and um you know he he was um he was fine with recording the way I wanted to record, like tracking live, you know, with live vocals and all that kind of stuff, like getting performances and all those kind of things. Like he really, okay. he really took to that. And by the time we got to goal, we'd already made two other records. So, mm. I mean, I think the first album I made with him was with, with, with his old band, Whiskey Town. Okay. And he'd never recorded live vocals at that point. And so he, you know, I remember there being a few days at the beginning of that record where he wasn't sure that it was the right way to go but he warmed to it really quickly. And, and I think he's done it that way ever since. So yeah. he got the reason why it's the, the best way to do it. Um, sure. But yeah. that was an incredibly uh, inspired time. We made that record gold. We did in, I think it was six weeks um, okay. and it was 26 songs or something in the end. I mean, they cut it down annoyingly. They, they, it was only supposed, it was supposed to be a double album. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, and um, there was some weird thing went on where they where they they kind of chopped it down for the CD or whatever, and then and then weirdly, and I had to resequence it. I remember the toughest thing about that that record was resequencing it after they told me that because I had the whole thing mapped out, mm -hmm. side one, side two, side three, side four, and they all had their own sound. Yeah, and they were you know there, there was a sort of anyway whatever, and that kind of went out the window, and I had to jumble it up and then the thing ends up coming out on vinyl anyway and they just chuck the five songs that we left off on the on side for it was so annoying oh, <laughs> shit. It was such a, like go oh, come on but um you know it was very i mean it was very inspiring time we we kind of you know rock up to the studio and ostensibly we kind of jam for half an hour and he'd write some lyrics and we'd record it and we do two a day, you know, we were working mm. incredibly fast. We didn't have time to sort of stop and think. It's incredible looking back actually what we managed to achieve on that record in the time that we did. Um, yeah. You know, we were really, really on it, I think. Um, it's a really great sounding record. We did it at Sunset Sound, which is, a, was a, I don't think it's still going. I'm not sure that it's still there anymore. I think it's, I think somebody owns it now. Great studio in North Hollywood, with an yeah. API and a 24 track tape machine very simple stuff just 24 tracks um and um nice. yeah great 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 fun amazing amazing experience some great songs on there yeah oh, definitely it's, it's yeah good. and then for a couple of years later um obviously you were working with kings of leon so you worked on the holy road uh, novocaine ep um and yeah. then youth and young manhood a heart shake heartbreak because of the times um, yeah i've seen a, a quite a run yeah, I saw an interview with you. Um, it was actually the making of Youth in Your Manhood, actually. And um, you were kind of, it was a small 15, 20 minute documentary. And they asked you a question. And you said, what really brought you, what really attracted you to Kings of Leon was like the melodies, the rawness of them, and just how pure they were, really, in, in their early songs. Um, yeah, do you, do yeah. you remember some, some of your, obviously, can you maybe elaborate on that a little bit? or? Yeah, I mean, that was an interesting, uh, interesting experience. That that whole thing, mm. you know, the band had been put together after the initial batch of tunes had been sent out. So I'd signed on to make to make a record with them, but and and it was really initially just the two brothers, Nathan and Caleb. Yeah, they were the ones that originally got signed to RCA, and then and then they decided that they wanted to bring. They wanted it to be a band after that. Mm -hmm. So the songs, the songs, the, the the two that really got me was were Holy Rolling Overcame, but a Wicker Chair was the one that really, yeah, 
I thought was the most interesting. And, and actually, I, I think lyrically, I think one of the one of the most special things about them and their early records were, were uh, uh, Caleb's lyrics. Apart from the energy of the band, yeah, which was remarkable. So when I went down to Memphis to see them play, no one had actually heard the band. I, I, I don't even think that anyone in the label had even heard the band. Okay, um, with the two with the brother and the cousin, you know. Yeah. So I think they were very unsure as to how that was going to turn out, and um, I didn't know what to expect either. Mm -hmm. um but i i remember very clearly walking into the rehearsal room i think we were in nashville we recorded it in memphis but i'm pretty sure i met them in nashville first mm. and they just launched into i can't know which tune it was but it would have been one of the songs off that ep and it was so it was so good they were so exciting that yeah. kind of um The, the 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 just the pure energy of what they were doing knocked me sideways I, I i my jaw just hit the floor it was one of the most exciting things i'd heard in a long time i hadn't heard a rock and roll by the band like that for 20 years really you know okay, they, yeah. it was so, it was so good we well, you know it was a little bit of clash in there I, I guess but yeah you know it and then combined with this really interesting lyrics and everything and they just knocked me out. I just thought they were amazing. And you could tell that they'd only just started playing, but it didn't matter. The commitment was so, was so full on. Exactly, Jared yeah. was like 15. He'd only been playing for three yeah. months or whatever, but he was, but he was so dedicated and committed, mm -hmm. you know? So we got in there and we, you know, we got, we did some arrangemental work and a few bits and pieces and we just went in there and, and, and cut it. And, and thank God the label just loved it. You know, they just thought it was great, which says a lot because I think it was Steve Rabowski was the guy that signed them. And um, it was not what they had signed, you know, that it, it, it had become something else. But I think the okay. fact that they recognized that they had something really special there and they, that, you know, they didn't come in and immediately go, well, this isn't what we thought it was going to be. Yeah. And, and, and then try and change it. They kind of went, this is amazing. We got to put this out. That that's quite mm. rare in the business to find someone in the you know in A and R that that can, that, that, that can kind of change tack like that. You know, mm. um, yeah. and thank God they did. I mean, it it obviously it it, so, it it sold immediately. I mean, it was an overnight success. It was wow. really shocking to me. Actually, I was really surprised. For well, because sure. there was nothing out there that sounded anything like it at the time. I mean, I didn't think they were going to be a chart busting yeah. Radio One you know kind of kind of bad i mean i was, I was thrilled that people responded to it i mean mm. it was great to see i was so happy yeah. that people dug it as hard as they did you know because they deserved it they were amazing i thought yeah they really took um, off in but, in the uk but, especially as well first didn't they and um but yeah um, yeah yeah go and touch them back on that i was i remember uh wicker chair being such a great song as well i was actually really gutted that it wasn't on um it never made the album in the end did it um no it was always just going to be on the ep i mean i say always just going to be on the ep yeah it was yeah that's right just on the just on the ep great song though one yeah. of one of their one of my favorites of theirs really. and um so you were working in the studio was was angelo in the studio as well of you at this time or did you kind of no he was there um he was there before beforehand he didn't he kind of he came down he helped he was really cool man angelo yeah. was um you know he lent us a guitar in an amp and and you know he'd obviously he'd been working with the brothers yeah um as a co-writer and and you know i think he'd been a, a mentor to them up until that up until then when actually continued to be over the over the year over the years um yeah but i think he knew at that point at least that i was i, I was producing it and i kind of had it covered and, yeah, and yeah. so he 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 very quickly came down for the first first day but he left he left on the first day you know and it was very cool you know it wasn't mm -hmm. like it wasn't a big deal one way or the other but there, i don't think i think he realized there wasn't much for him to do down there we were doing it you know it was it was getting that yeah. we were getting the job done then he came back in at the end of the record they wanted us to recut one of the songs for radio i can't remember which one it was now um and they wanted to do it in nashville and they wanted angelo to be there 
as a co-producer, which I was perfectly happy with. Yeah. Um, so, but, but primarily for the recording of that first album was mostly just me in the band. Um, yeah. Like I say, Angelo came in for that for that to co-produce that last track, and then and then we did the second one together. Okay. Um, and um, and we did the third one together too. I mean, I won't. Man, you know what? It's like a soap opera. That that yeah. band, what they became, <laughs> what they oh, became. Yeah, for sure. Um, so but um, yeah, there was all kinds of uh, shenanigans going off and on between. In those, well, I, we won't go into any of that nonsense now because there's no yeah. point really. But yeah, um, but, but they were they were a good band, man. Really, really good band. Great songs, and um, for sure, know, yeah. I'm very proud of those. Songs. I think they're amazing. Definitely, yeah. Can I just finally one, one more for for the little Kings of Leon patch. Um, what would you say? Yeah. Like, obviously, because of the times, the third the third record. It's, it's chalk and cheese in a way from the from youth and young manhood like that it's a lot more like kind of you kind of got a stadium rock sound to it obviously they were touring yes. with touring with you two and other bands like that at the time or just before yeah so they were obviously when you hang, start hanging around with the big boys you start thinking like them as well and um how, how was it different well, in the studio you know, for, it, I, it, wasn't, it wasn't any different in the studio. It was okay. the same. It was uh, We recorded that record in the same way we recorded the other ones. I might have spent a little bit more time. I knew I got the right, I got the appropriate sound for the material. Hmm. Um, but the, re, the it was quite legitimate the way that thing went. They wrote that third record on the road during the soundtracks when they were opening for U2. Yeah. And so, the, and, the, and they were playing... I went to see them at the Staples Center in LA and it was it was ridiculous to see a, a, a tight little garage band playing garage man tempos all huddled together in the middle of a stage in the middle of this arena yeah because um, it was just a wall of noise I mean you can't play high tempo punk music in that kind of environment because it just gets washes out right yeah, yeah. So when you get on stage and you start playing in those environments, you slow everything down because of the sound in the room. Mm -hmm. So that's why the material on that record ended up going the way that it did was because it, they were written on stages in arenas and it's what yeah. sounded best to them yeah. at the time. I think that was the main reason why it went down that road. So when that material, I mean, that's my take on it anyway. Yeah. That was yeah. what I witnessed. I mean, who knows if they were sort of secretly sitting down plotting world domination? I don't know. I don't think so. But no. then I could be wrong. I don't know. But um, and so the sound that I got in the studio there, rather than using three microphones on the drums, I knew that I had to mic everything up individually and, and you know, I had to isolate guitars. I mean, the records that we cut before, they were all in the same room and it was very kind of punky and garagey and um, but with because of the times, we I needed to be able to control the sound a lot more. Okay. So I isolated every all the amps and everything, and I got I got a bit more tricky with the drum sound. And because they didn't have a keyboard player, I started to mess around with um, with audio treatments for some of the, a, a lot of the atmospheric stuff that you hear in there is me messing around with elements that exists with guitar parts or vocals or whatever and processing them and putting and creating layers of tuned layers of sound okay yeah. but i still cut it it was still analog you know we still cut it to tape and okay. i still mixed it on a console with faders and all that stuff i mean it's still very old school but i was using a lot more i was using digital reverbs and things like that okay. um and you know so but that's the whole that's the whole deal you know if you're you've got to get the right sound for the tune you know mm -hmm. of what it is that they're doing for sure yeah uh you've got to let the material kind of define whatever kind of landscape that you're trying to you're trying to create um yeah it was it was fun making that record in a lot of ways um but you know things had started to i think the pressure had really started to get to them at that point and the money yeah. had, you know had, had come things were definitely changing man yeah, <laughs> for yeah. sure definitely so I was quite happy to sort of gracefully okay. <laughs> leave them to it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and another another great album you worked on, um, Sunny Side Up with Paolo. Paolo and your team. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Another, another phenomenal album. Real, real good album. Um, 
So I'm guessing that was around 2008, 2009. I think it came out in 2009. So uh, uh, yeah, probably. I don't know. Uh, yeah. How, how was he to work with? He's a bit more, a bit more chilled, laid back, relaxed, or that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Paolo's a law into himself, really. You know, um, yeah. an incredible singer. Yeah. And he lived with me here. We actually, we made, we, we, we worked, we worked, we did a lot of work on that record in this very room, actually. Um, okay. And he lived here. I've got an apartment above this room here and, and um, he lived here for about two months. Okay. And he was lovely, man. He got, you know, he got, he became one of the family. In fact, when my, my second daughter was born, yeah. he stayed home and looked after my eldest daughter while we went off, you know, he like, he, he oh, was, okay. he's a yeah. lovely, he was a lovely guy um you know and again very instrumental into into you know he he uh he, he put a lot of he put a lot of time into that record we you know I, so yeah. yeah that was it was i don't i mean i it's funny i don't really remember that much about it other than it, it, it was just it took a long time it just took a long time to to make um okay. um but um I think, funnily enough, some of the best stuff actually we did very, very quickly. I think um, coming up easy, we recorded live. Okay. Uh, there were two. There are two tracks on that record that we cut live with the band. Maybe three. I can't really remember that much about it. Um, yeah. In detail. But um, I love coming up easy. I love the sound of that record. I love the take. I love the vocal. That was a live vocal. Okay. Um, yeah, that well, was nice. yeah. it was fun, and I was again. I was very, very, very happy that that record was as well, that enjoyed by as many people as it was. It was great that, for sure, um, you know, pencil full of lead, great single, and and obviously a lot of people responded to it. It was fantastic to hear that thing on the radio. It made me very happy. Made me smile. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah it, was, it, was, it was fun. It was a fun one. Cool, and then um, so later later on, obviously, I could. I could talk all day long about various bands and stuff that you've produced for, but um, uh, the last 10 years or so, you've worked with some real, real big legends like Paul McCartney and Tom Jones as well. And uh, yeah, how is it, how is it working? It's kind of gone full circle a bit in that, in that regard. These are, these are more people, maybe your, your dad would have like, in, in uh, kind of yeah, era, right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, you know, it was fantastic. I love working with uh, with artists that have been around that have yeah. got experience. You know, it's. I mean, I love working with young artists as well. It's just as exciting to work with people that are just starting to figure it out. There's a great energy to those um, those situations, um, which is you know, kind of really inspiring. Um, but then then also working with people that have it can be a little less complicated you know they they because they they kind of figured out who they are a little bit they don't maybe they have so much to prove mm -hmm. um you know you can you can you, you some of the more complex issues psych, sort of psychological issues that can come up tend not to be there in you know they they they, 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 they maybe maybe you'll get some different ones but you know i think as you get older you kind of know who you are a little bit more and you may be a little bit less um I don't know, it maybe gets a little easier, maybe, but also yeah. you bring the experience to bear into the creative process and that that can yield some really interesting results too. Um, we're obviously incredible working with Paul to have the experience of being in a creative situation with him was was a, literally a dream come true. It was amazing, you know, and, and I loved working with him. Yeah, I loved hanging out with him, which is you know, pretty much what we did. We just hung out in the studio and made some music. It was great. Um, working with Tom, incredible. You know, he's one of the greatest singers that has ever strode the earth, you know. Yeah. So having an opportunity to work with a singer like that is, is fantastic. Yeah. Obviously, you know, challenging in their own ways, trying to find the right material and all those kinds of things. And also try and do things that are, trying to find new things to do with an artist that's on that uh, album 50, you know, that can, yeah. that's an interesting one. Trying to balance out the difference between, you know, 
what might be expected of an artist and you know it's very it can, you know it has its own set of challenges but yeah but tom's great he's you know tremendous trust you know in that you know we've been able to do some re this new record that we've got coming out in a few months is is some really outside stuff on there man there's some really weird okay but fabulous beautiful very very unique sounding stuff on that new record um Nice. it's so cool man it's just amazing actually so cool um, yeah it's been it's been great it's hectic it's been yeah amazing. so so currently obviously with with lockdown how how is the whole um how, how has life as a producer and musician been really for you over the last year and uh yeah what's your future plans well it's been really it's been really difficult because i've been doing a lot of you know, as I say, I've been a musician this whole, you know, since the beginning, and I've, mm. I've had a band. I've got a band called the Black Eyed Dogs. Yeah. Um, we've been going for six, seven years now, I guess. We've been, you know, we do try and play live as much as possible, and um, and we were, you know, things were really starting to go well. We had a, we had some great. Last year was amazing. Not last year, year before was great. Um, you know, we had a amazing set of Black Deer, and we played. We played Red Rooster. That was that was amazing, you know. Okay. So things would just start. We would just start to get a little bit of momentum going, and then the rug gets pulled. Yeah. Um, which has been really awful. And I know that all the musicians that I know have struggled terribly with um, not being able to play without being able to go out and even just the social aspect of kind of gathering and listening to your friends play music. Yeah, yeah. Let alone actually having an outlet for your own stuff has been really difficult for people. But you know, yeah. I think everybody's kind of um, just done their best with it. You know, I put the time to good use. I I I play every day still, and we're we're doing we're working up a new set. Um, one of my favourite bands of all time is the Grateful Dead. Okay. Um, in fact, I would probably go as far as to say, legitimately, I I am officially a dead. Um, I, I listen to them probably well not even probably I listen to them more than any other band by a long way okay. and so we're playing um, we've got a we've got we're now doing a thing called Dog Play Dead um, so we've been getting that set together we're playing Maverick Festival this year with that okay, um, cool. and hopefully a couple of others too um, so I've been working on that that set and trying to figure out what what tunes we're going to play and learning learning all of those when I mean, it's, it's a huge catalogue um, yeah. so i mean i've really spent most of lockdown just playing guitar learning grateful dead songs and it's been it's actually been pretty good but it has been very lonely i miss my band yeah <laughs> it's my band a lot <laughs> for sure um for sure but you know i guess hopefully we you know we all have that. you know everybody's everybody's um had a rough time with it you know but it that's all right. I think the, I think the light is it is definitely appearing on the horizon. I feel yeah. I'm, I'm staying really positive about That's it. it. I think I think we're going to I think we're going to push through and I think it's going to be all right. You yeah. know. That's, so that's, that's it really that in terms of uh plans for the future it's to get 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 back out on the road with the band and cool. And get the black eyed dogs playing again and and uh that's pretty much it. There's a few other things that I've, I'm working on. I've got a few things cooking, but um, yeah. you know, I won't, I won't count my chickens before they hatch, if you know what I mean. But you know, cool, yeah. Got a, got a, got a few amazing things on the, on the boiler that might come off and may not. Who knows? Sure. But you know, things are pretty good. Ethan, I've got, um, I've been doing some quick fires to finish up with, um, with my guests so far. Is that okay if I ping some over to you? Okay. Um, yeah give it a one give it a give it a give it a we'll give it a crack see okay uh, what well, what would you prefer my brain is at the moment okay we'll what, see. what would you prefer <laughs> being um at home or on the road on the whoa. well on the road but you know i i but i love being around my family so it really is that is not fair um <laughs> because uh I could not sure. choose between the two. Luckily, I've, I can I, I am able to do both. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. But my kids, you know, obviously, 
you, you can't you can't ask a father that question. No, not fair. True. Um, you can ask your twenty two year olds that don't have kids. You can ask them that question <laughs> any day of the week. <laughs> um, up north or down south? <laughs> Okay. Um, Music-wise, UK or the USA? Quick fire question. Yeah. Oh man, these are I can't answer these questions. That's ridiculous. Come on. Because I always see the positive in everything, right? Let's just go back. We're gonna go. We'll go. No, I do. I do. I love. One of my favourite things to do was touring like Scotland. Yeah, yeah. You talk about up north. My immediately go well obviously up north you know i love i mean touring the highlands up there i've got friends that live on the islands up there just oh, incredible yeah, yeah but then my home is down south and and you know i was born in sussex so I, that's really really tricky and then america england it's like well shit man you've got grateful dead on the one hand and then you've got the who on the other and you kind of go well you know is one really better than the other well some people will tell you definitively yes, <laughs> but I'm not that guy cool. because I think that's bullshit. There, you know, it's not. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. So try again. <laughs> All good. Um, let's see. Uh, well, if you could have produced for anyone, um, anyone ever, alive or dead, who who would it be? Maybe spend a spend a month in the studio with them. <sighs> Alive or dead? Yeah. Wow. Um, that's a really hard question. You know, I, I, yeah, I, I don't know, mate. I, I can't, <laughs> I, I, my brain isn't going alive yeah. or dead. Yeah, I don't know. Again, I, I don't really think along those terms. I don't, I don't kind of futurize, you know? Mm. I mean, it's like whoever, I don't chase artists, you know? It's no. like, if, any, if someone wants to make a record with me, they contact me. And if I am inspired by it and I'm like lit up by it, then I'll do it. So sure. it's not like I sit around and think, oh man, I'd love to make a record with this person or that person because it, it has to be initiated from them. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. For it to... to to be to be right if you like they have to want to work with me for it to work but you know that isn't really the spirit of the question i'm just i'm just i'm just diverting it really um i would say um you know he, you know how i wouldn't have mind spending a bit of time with maybe um like woody guthrie would have been pretty interesting you know charlie parker would have been amazing to record him miles davis would have been pretty incredible um yeah i mean man the list is is actually kind of endless really yeah, yeah. Of um, course. it's a uh, difficult one it's a tricky one yeah sorry man that's i'm not doing a very good job am i on the quick fires <laughs> you're all good <laughs> um uh, just a final one um do you have like a, a an album you're most proud of or a, pr a proudest achievement in your musical career or is it just kind of again all i'm happy with the work i've done or there's no most proud and no least proud. <laughs> yeah, I, I, no, no, there's none of that. I think, I think I've got, you know, the, the most of the highlights have been gigs. I mean, that's something I, you know, uh, like playing, I remember, you know, we pl I played um, some incredible venues over the year. I mean, I played Red, I remember, play, I remember playing Red Rocks. Okay in in denver and colorado was pretty memorable there was another gig actually on that tour uh, we played um, i played the 25th anniversary of woodstock with crosby stills and nash that was a pretty memorable show wow, yeah. um you're playing albert hall carnegie hall you know that and then and then some of the small you know then you know there are also some of the smaller ones i mean probably playing the troubadour with Ray montaigne that was an incredible show you know what i mean they're all shows weirdly yeah. Yeah. i mean i think i think the albums are they're just like little postcards of moments in time they're 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 snapshots of of musical moments to me you know and and so they're quite sort of 
they're, they're kind of weirdly un, un, unnatural. Well, they're just like, mem- they're like, you know, like I said, like little snapshots of memories. Yeah. To me, I'm so into the process of creating music and making music, improvising, being in that moment, that that's the thing that really excites me. So, yeah. you know, in a funny kind of way, making records is, you know, it's like a, it's, that is like a secondary byproduct to the process of actually getting in a room and, and making music with people. And that, yeah. that's the thing that really is exciting to me. Okay, cool. Uh, going on those, those searches and trying to find those magic moments. And then you've got a tape machine running, you've captured them. So, but to me, you know, getting on stage in front of a room full of people or in an incredible amphitheater or wherever it is that you're playing, those are the moments that are really exciting. And, and, particularly because you've got that the, you've got the life so you've got the you've got an audience there so the energy of that is really is really lit up i mean i've started to do the last two albums we put out with the dogs are both live records okay. i'm going further and further down that road when i can i mean obviously you know if you know the, the studio albums are, i'm always going to be you know continuing to make studio records but the thing that really that's really kind of alive in me at the moment is, is the experience of getting on stage with a band and playing and improvising and mm-hmm. having an experience with an audience. <clears throat> and then, and then just recording that and, and putting that out as the, as, as the document of those times, um, which I've been doing with my band. Um, cool. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find anyone, other artists that are, are, are willing to do that. <laughs> and not many people have done it over the years. A few people have tried to do it and not, not never really managed to do. I remember Neil Young tried to make a live album, a new material back in whenever it was, and he, it never came out. So okay. trying to remember, I can't think of anyone else that's done it actually, but we did, the Black Eyed Dogs did. did. Um, uh, no, nice. actually that's that's not true. It wasn't new material. Um, I mean, but anyway, yeah, so that. that's, that's where I'm at, you know, yeah. Cool. Well, Ethan. There's no doubt there's something about that. That, you know, I mean, it's, I listen. Yeah, go on, mate. No, 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 you, you, you carry on, honestly. Sorry, I interrupted. <laughs> you froze. No, 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 we think we've got a bit of a delay going on there. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, I'll no, just... it's, it's fine. I'm just saying, I listen to so much live music now. You know, that's really all I was going to say. Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, yeah, Ethan is... Well worth uh, doing. Go, go and have a look at some of your favourite artists and go check out some. Yeah, for sure. I prefer, like, that's obviously the... Some, some of the bands I, I go and watch, when when a lead singer will maybe, you know, the, the crowd are anticipating a certain lyric and he'll sway off and say something else that maybe is apparent that night or just kind of a little inside joke with the band or whatever and just... Yeah, all them little off-the-cuff moments that you don't really get on a live re- on a normal studio record um, that you get in a live environment. Yeah, it's always there, always little gems, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, really, really special. And actually, and just to finish it up, yeah, a lot of the records that we talked about those those moments are on those records like you know that are, are for, uh, you know just too, very quickly uh, this will give you an idea like gold yeah. there are nine first takes on that album oh wow i remember when we finished recording that or the guy that was assisting me went back through and he went down all the take numbers so so much of what you hear on that record is off the cuff you know and not planned and are those moments of like whoa you know there's a, a, that's what makes those records great the kings of Leon's the same we cut all those records live you know mm. and they never played it exactly the same way twice and the great ones were always when the unexpected stuff happened anyway there you go so just just to sort of tie it all in yeah you know it's uh there's it runs through all of the stuff that i, that I love but anyway. Cheers, lovely cheers. talking to you jack thank you yeah. so much mate good luck with everything i hope it keeps going well and if uh you know, drop us a line anytime cheers yeah thanks a lot for your time ethan i appreciate